start first this talk i've read somewhere you have quite strong ties with yugoslavia and you know i was born in yugoslavia and yeah you're not in yugoslavia anymore i mean you're not in slovenia anymore are you yeah honest? i mean i'm in slovenia which was part of former yeah. yugoslavia so, I, yeah i'm well aware yeah 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 so i wanted to, to to ask you like what's your connection with this part of? well i mean world? it's my, my former wife is from belgrade oh really i didn't know that okay yeah so um so my son is a dual national and um but i spent a lot of time in the ex yugoslavia especially in the early to the late 80s right before right before the collapse of the the yugoslav wow sfrj right before right before the collapse of the sf i was oh, there right, right before oh shit yeah i remember still everything i mean it's like yeah uh... and um my first record that i put out under my own name was based on my experiences kind of being in this situation where my relationship was falling apart at the same time that the country was falling apart disco bonite right you mean yeah yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. i love that record yeah that's a beautiful thank you yeah. thank you oh okay good interesting yeah because like so oh, it, I, you, know. you know i i haven't been i mean i've been to slovenia i mean when was the last time it was still pretty long ago i saw you I, the last time in ljubljana a solo yeah movie. well i think i was was i i think i was in maribor after i was in ljubljana uh i think i was in maribor with the cubanos postizos maybe like i don't know seven eight years ago or something like that yeah, you shit, know i don't remember I, I mean i'm from maribor but i, I don't remember you oh no you were on the festival exactly yeah 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. okay yeah yeah but you know, I've been many times to Slovenia since. I've been a couple of times to Croatia. I've been a couple, of, but I actually haven't been back to Serbia since. Oof, like it's about it's more than twenty years at this point. Wow. Yeah, I used to go like I used to spend you know I spent a lot of time in those years, sure. especially in Serbia, but everywhere in every you know we you know a lot of my my family not the family I married into has has a house in Dubrava which is right next to Bar mm -hmm. yeah yeah sure in in um interesting well wow. the Montenegro on the Montenegrin coast you know right by the Montenegrin coast so that's actually where it all kind of fell apart that's where everything I, I was there uh I was there in the summer of 1987 and um it was all it, everything was changing every second and it was really yeah. crazy yeah wow interesting okay well but uh, every once in a while yeah. every once in a while i feel like i want to dig up my rusty well of course there is no more such thing as serbo croatian you know but like to to try to find my space inside of my memories of language but it, the problem is i don't really have people to talk to yeah. and also the language has changed so much that um yeah. yeah, I mean, if you spoke server creation, I think everyone would understand you still. Of course, it's, they would understand, you know, but, it, but but it would, it would it would require a big trip. Yeah. I think it would require a big trip, you know, um, <laughs> and that hasn't happened in a long time. <laughs> Interesting. Wow. Okay. Cool. Uh, the, the last record I, I have by you is Catenary Oath, two thousand nineteen. Uh huh. Um, and the, since then, I've uh, made. Another solo record that came out. Um, actually, you know, I recorded the solo record before that was recorded in Ljubljana. It was oh yeah, well, on the Eastex yeah. label, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's what I have. Yeah, it's a beautiful. And then after that, I recorded a record for a small label in um, in um, uh, French Canada that came out on a piece of fabric. <laughs> oh wow! Seriously, yeah, you have to buy. Have to buy. You have to buy the artwork, and when you get the artwork, then it comes with a download code. You know. Uh, okay, that's a nice idea. It's very interesting. Yeah. Um, and um, 
then I also made a duo record with um, Brian Chase that came out more recently mm. uh, called Arcades. Mm. Okay, I have to find this one. And yeah, I, I'm working. I don't know. I'm trying trying to make things. You know, it's it's complicated. It's like I I just I I have never started my own label. I don't know if you have your own label. But, yeah, I do. Um, I do. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it seems like the only way to do things at this point. You know. <laughs> Yeah, it's like eighty percent of the musicians I talk to within this series, they they do it on their own. Like the last, I mean, it years. seems necessary. It really does yeah. seem necessary, and I've been thinking about it a lot, especially in the last couple of years, because it's just been like every once in a while I'm talking to somebody about putting something out, and then we almost do it, and then we don't do it. But I am going to put out a solo record in a hopefully in a couple of months on Elliot Sharp's label Zor. Fantastic. Okay. Yeah, yeah, because Elliot, Elliot's got his label very active. Yeah, yeah, it's good. I mean, yeah, I wanted to ask you, like, what's happening on the department of well, you bringing I, out I, albums, I, you know? So that's... I don't know. I have like a million things in the can, you know. I'm just like trying to figure out whether I should put them out myself or whether I, you know, there's been these things where it's come very close to putting out a record and then didn't happen, and you know. Mm. But I'm playing all the time again, which is interesting. <laughs> <laughs> that's good but uh, uh, do you also have some groups going on i mean I, I know you've been doing lots of solo piano work but like i've been more doing that lately i mean i haven't been having some very ad hoc groups i guess you could say yeah like last night i played duo with uh satoshi takeshi really and, oh, nice. yeah and, and that was really great and of course we're thinking of doing more because i've played with satoshi through the years many times but we very rarely recorded together. So, I mean, I'm I'm hoping that's something that we can do. And Beautiful. next week I'm playing duo with Matt Maneri. So that'll be also oh. really interesting. And Matt is also somebody that I've played with a real lot, but I've never recorded with. So the, it just seems like these are things that should happen, but just have to be organized, you know? Yeah. And, um, yeah. Yeah. and then a lot of my time the last couple of years was taken up. It's again these situations. I seem to get involved with countries. I, I, let's say it's strange times, you know. Because um, the last couple of years, I've been working on a musical about the avant-garde in Ukraine wow. in the nineteen twenties, and we started the musical in Kharkiv, Ukraine, right before the war started, and then we had to mu move the musical to New York. With a mostly Ukrainian, but not hold not hundred percent Ukrainian cast, and so I wrote all the music for this. It was like you know, full three act musical, and wow. uh, had a seven piece band, and that's that was a lot of my work for two years. Hmm. Wow! But I don't know if any of that will ever come out on record because just because I don't know if I want it to. I mean, I of course if, let's put it this way: if it were the old days. And somebody said, I really want to make a record of this musical. I really like the music of this musical. Let's make a record. Of course, I would say yes. But when it's you have to produce it yourself yeah, yeah. and yeah. pay for it and all, you know, then I'm not so sure. Then I'm not so sure. Yeah. And the solo piano is always the best option. <laughs> it's certainly the easiest. You have nobody to blame but yourself, you know. Exactly. Yeah. But I mean, it's really because it's not just the seven musicians. It's also all the singers. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, all of that. Yeah, studio time. Uh, yeah, design I mean, I like, everything. Yeah. And if I and if I'm going to put that kind of time and effort into something, I definitely don't think that the as much as I love the music from the musical. Like, I mean, how I don't know if you own a lot of musical records or um, original cast recordings of musicals, but I can so tell much, you yeah. that I think that I own three. Yeah, I, I don't think I own <laughs> one actually. I think I have, out of all the musicals that have ever existed in the universe, and two of those are by Kurt Vile. They almost don't count, you know? Yeah. <laughs> two of them are by Kurt Vile, and one of them is by Cole Porter, and I think that's it. So yeah. that's why. I mean, sure, it's great. I mean, when I think about original cast recordings of musicals, I think about my aunt, my late aunt. She had like a huge, that was like, there was a certain kind of middle class Jewish family that used to always have lots of recordings of musicals. When I, <laughs> so I associated with that, you know, having sitting at home and listening to the sound of music or whatever, you know. Yeah.
<laughs> how did how did you stumble upon jazz? I mean, like I I guess mid early seventies. Well, what were, it's an what interesting were the story anyway. It's an interesting story in a way because um it's very connected. <laughs> I think now we have to all talk about these things nowadays. I mean, people were always a little bit more nervous about talking about these things in the past, but now everybody now it's become a cliche. Um, my introduction to jazz is also very connected to trauma. And mm -hmm. uh, um, so recently, uh, Bob Roosh, who ran Cadence Records, died. And mm -hmm. and um, before he died, a bunch of the children that he had abused uh, tried to take him to court because even though it was beyond the statute of limitations, they reopened a window where people who had never done. And so there was a three part article. This is not, see, now I feel very free to talk about this because there was a three part article that anybody can find in the, um, in the wall street journal about this story. And these were my schoolmates mm -hmm. and uh, it just so how, okay. So I grew up in a family where there was a lot of listening to music. Not musicians, but a lot of listening to music. And it was a very left-wing family and a kind of left-wing New York, Jewish, socialist, mm. not communist. Big difference between socialists in New York and communists in oh, New sure. York. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. But there was a lot of music that connects to that in a way. I mean, which I could give you a whole list, but it was like a lot of things that were like folk music and many different things. But I never really heard jazz in my house except for Billie Holiday because mm -hmm. my mother was obsessed with Billie Holiday. So Billie Holiday trumped everything. There would be like lots of... But then when, when I was in seventh grade and I was in Bob Roosh's class, he was my seventh grade teacher. And he was... His whole year was pretty much devoted a lot to African-American studies. So we had this like extreme immersion in African-American studies. So it's really funny because it's a double-edged sword. You know, on the one hand, the guy was a terrible abuser who should have been thrown in jail. On the other hand, he introduced me to all of this music, yeah. you know, <laughs> because it was, it, and it wasn't just music. It was like, we were reading the autobiography of Malcolm X in class, you know, this is when we were 12 and we're talking about 19, um, we're talking about 1967, just well, so you, yeah. you get you get a little bit of perspective. We were going to the Poor People's March in Washington with wow. Dr. Abernathy, who um, who succeeded Dr. King, you know, and we were going, we were doing all of these things. And then as part of that, we went to hear Rasan Roland Kirk at the Vanguard as a class. Ooh. And, um, and you know, and, and, and then things were starting to become interesting to me but originally I, I did a big project on Scott Joplin which is very interesting because it sort of set the tone for my life in a way because mm -hmm. the whole idea of the pianist composer pianist composer coming out of the African-American music tradition that became a really interesting concept to me because I'd grown up listening to so much folk music and so much black folk music you know especially people like Lead Belly, yeah. Brownie McKee, Sonny Terry and like you know and I, that's, I listened to a lot of that music when I was growing up. And so this connection went, especially when I read the book, They All Played Ragtime by Rudy Blesch and Harriet Janis. And they were, and he kept banging against the wall, banging, you know, he had, he had certain ideas that he really wanted to prove in that book. And one was that Joplin's music came directly out of the folk tradition. And that really interested me. I don't even know if it's how true it is now when I look back. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of connections. Yeah, yeah. But, but I became really interested in that. And that sort of led to wanting to be interested in other people who had been piano pianist composers. So that led me to Jelly Roll Morton. That led me to Duke Ellington, which, you know, slowly get, led me to Thelonious Monk and so on, so on, so on. But at the same time, also, when I was in seventh grade, Jackie Byard came to class as a guest. Mm, wow, man. Okay. Yeah. And when Jackie came, I didn't know a lot about a lot of things. But I did know <laughs> there's two things I knew, or three. One thing I knew was this guy was mixing up things that came from very old jazz with things that were new. 
And then another thing that I knew, I didn't really actually like newer jazz yet at that time. Like I had really listened to very little, except when we went to hear Rasan, but I hadn't really listened to very much. But I knew that I didn't want to be one of these people who only was working with very old things, you know? I knew that, but I knew I was also very attracted to very old things. And then here was this guy who was just doing it like so naturally, just like boom, 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 mm. boom, boom. He played for us. You know, he was very, very good with kids, very good with everybody. Jackie was good with everybody, except mm. with except with terrible people. But, you know, and so I went up to him and I, I played a little bit of piano, but mostly like blues piano, kind of like very rudimentary blues piano. I tried to be a guitarist before that. And oh, really? um, oh, well. yeah, and I went to this, you know, very lefty summer camp. And in this summer camp was a guy named Johnny Willinger. And he had a Martin guitar and uh, he had learned all the kind of, all the styles of finger picking, especially like the Elizabeth Cotton style finger picking. And he could play freight train. He could play like the hell out of it. And I would just try and try and try. And I couldn't get close to that. I couldn't make my left hand move like that. I couldn't make my right hand move like that. And I just used to cry. I was just like, I literally cry, you know, because like Johnny would just sit there and he would do it. And I would just be like, ah, you know, so like, <laughs> so some. So sometimes I used to think, okay, I'm going to be in music, but I don't know if I'm going to be in music as a performer, because all of these things just seem too daunting to me. They just, and then, you know, I look around the world and there's lots of people who are in music who are not performers, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, lots of, in all kinds of ways. And then I would think about that. And then I would think about me and I would go like, Oh, I don't know. That's great for the, for that's great for the people who that's great for, but I don't know if it's great for me. And then I met Jackie when I was 12, you know, between 12 and 13. And I went up to him and I said, well, do you teach? And he said, yes. And I said, can I study with you? And he said, yes. And uh, wow. I used to go to his house in Queens all the time from the time when I was 13 to the time when I was 17. Wow. Man. And, okay. Yeah. That, and that's how I ended up going to New England Conservatory because he taught there and he, he, he suggested that I teach, that I go to wow. school there. Interesting. Funny thing is once I got there, okay, so that's a whole long story, which I, I don't want, you, you can tell me how much you're interested or what, but point is, it's like, I started doing because I was got more and more interested into Duke and Morton and Monk and so on. I started trying to compose a lot and I was composing a lot for the big band in high school because I went to an arts oh, wow. high school. And that made me think I was more maybe like a composer pianist than a pianist composer, more focused on the composing side. Like I would hear records like the records that Tad Dameron made with um, Fats Navarro and those Ooh. are great records. But the least good part of those records is Tad Dameron's actual piano playing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I would say like, okay, you know, here's a guy. He's a genius composer. And these people play his music great. And then he plays a certain amount of piano, you know, and that's fine. And he, and I heard that a lot, you know. It, it, there's a certain tradition of that. Not Monk, because Monk is still my favorite pianist in the world. Mm. You know, he has the weirdest way of playing, but it's, but he, but it's. I mean, it's. You know, I don't need. I mean, we don't need to talk. So yeah. you know, but I mean, Monk kind of ruined my life in a way because it's like I never wanted to do anything that Monk wouldn't do. You know, like if he wouldn't play runs, then I didn't want to play runs. Or if he played runs, they were his very particular kind of runs. So I wanted to have particular kind of runs too. So in those days when I heard like, quote unquote, good jazz piano, it used to make me like, Ugh, you know, just like, Ugh, I don't, I don't want to have anything to do with that. That's just like, it just sounds like cocktail music to me, you know? And, and that was a yeah, that's a whole long story of all of that. But long story short, because of that, I went to New England Conservatory as a jazz composer and not as a jazz pianist. Mm, and as okay. a result, as a result, I did not study with Jackie once I got to school because he only he was very busy and he could only teach the people who are like piano majors. So, <laughs> so after four years of studying with him as a kid. Then when I got to school, I never studied with him again. Wow. Which which is sad in a way, but you know. 
who did you study composition with on, on and well anything? it was a long story because um the first year i was a jazz composition major and i studied with george russell oh wow okay and then i decided i wanted and it's a long story why i decided but i decided i didn't want to be in the jazz composition department i really wanted to be in the I hate this. I hate the distinction between jazz composition and classical composition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it's a stupid distinction, but there were a lot of things I wanted to learn that I was not going to learn as a jazz composition major. So interestingly enough, Gunther Schuller was still the president of our school at that time. And I never really talked to Gunther, but my humanities teacher said, you should, you, this is the kind of thing you should talk to Gunther Schuller about, you know? And I said, okay. So I organized, I arranged a meeting and I told him what I wanted to do. And then I told the composition faculty what I wanted to do. And then there was a little bit of discussion and then I switched. So I studied with a whole bunch of composers that are much more associated with contemporary classical music of that time. I studied with Donald Martino. I studied with Jacob Druckmann. And so like, uh, I took one semester with Betsy Jolas. Um, like this, then that's where I, was, where I did my master's degree at Yale mm. School of Music. Well, so really, my degrees are all in classical composition, whatever that means. Yeah. Interesting. <laughs> interesting. Okay. Well, interesting. And I've well. made a couple of records like that, too. Like I, In fact, when we were talking about Catenary Oath, it reminds me that uh, Imga Berg came out after Catenary Oath, which is my record. I don't know if you know about this record, but no, no. let me send you a link. Can you make me, um, can you make me uh, the co-host? Yeah. Uh, or... No, I don't know if you need to. It, does, it looks okay. Hold on. I'll just let me send you a link to this. Good. Give me one second. I, you know, I have to do eight windows at a time to do this. Um, um, one minute. One minute. Uh, I worked with a chamber ensemble in uh, Vienna mm -hmm. called Studio Dan, and we made this record, and we played it at the uh, Saalfelden Festival. Oh, wow. Well, really? um, and also in Vienna at the Porgy and Bass. Uh, and this was a really great experience. So I don't want to forget that. That was uh, that was very interesting. And um, we did that. And it was good. Um, uh, let me, I don't know why it's not showing up, but it will. It will show up in one second. There we go, I think. There it is. Okay, here. Uh, let me go back to Zoom. Okay, <laughs> let me make it big again. And let me put this, uh, let me go open the chat again. And this is so wonderful. You can do all these things. Okay. Yeah, man, it's amazing. Oh, super. Great. I'll check it out. So, yeah, I got to make this record, which is like the, I've made now. So, if you count this, I guess I've made five or six records of my chamber music, you know? And yeah. that's been also a really important part of what I do. Definitely. And of, yeah. how does this all connect? I mean, I don't know if I even care, but in, <laughs> back in the day, let's put it this way. Back in the day, it was less common for people to do all of this stuff. And now it's like every Tom, Dick, and Harry does chamber music and improvises and you know whatever this so it's not even that special anymore <laughs> but it, uh, well, when i look at your 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 uh, it is you know it you know you you, you kind of combine jewish and improvised and well, there's Balkan all of that and chamber and uh you know the zorn stuff and uh, their mark rebo stuff it's like you're like this you know mash somehow like you seem to know everything, at least that's... Well, the, I was always... I it's interesting to. what I've never... You know, it's interesting to me what I've never done since I've done a lot of things. Like, one thing is really interesting to me is that I've never really played classical music as a pianist. That, mm. That's something I never really did, you know? And it's because I have this very schizophrenic background, you know, in the sense that my first really important teacher... I had teachers before, but my first really important teacher as a pianist was Jackie Byard. But then I got my two degrees in composition. So I never did try to bridge that gap with like really taking classical piano lessons and being able to play like a bunch of repertoire. It's not like I, I don't read repertoire. I try yeah, to read it. Yeah. But I mean, a lot of pianists, 
have a re- lot of improvising pianists nowadays have a really strong classical background as pianists. And my classical background is as a composer, but composer. not as a pianist. Yeah. 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 Which is interesting. I mean, you know, it's again, I, I'm going to blame Thelonious Monk for a lot of this, you know? <laughs> yeah. You, pi- I mean, you, you pianists have this. Yeah, that's that's for sure. No, but I mean, like, for example, when I when I have a class with classical pianists and I try to explain to them that, you know, a lot of times in classical piano teaching, people talk about relaxation and getting the most getting the most mileage out of how you move and how, you know, and all this stuff. And then I show them the video of Monk playing just a gigolo and I go like, so what do you think about this? Like, why do you think he makes those? Why do you think he holds his hand that way? Why do you think he holds his elbow that way? Do you think that there's a relationship to the sound that he makes and the way that he moves? And they're just like, sometimes they're just like, ah, you know? <laughs> don't like if I brought this into my teacher, he'd kill me, you know. And like, like, okay, but at the same time, you have to look in improvised music a lot of times, like the sound and the production of the sound, and and you know, a lot of times I guess. Because I teach in a, I teach besides teaching in New England, I was to teach at the New School, and there I mostly have classical music students, and my class is more like an introduction to improvisation. Whereas at New England Conservatory, I'm working with people who are already improvisers. Yeah. Um, so, like I'm saying to them, when you take lessons, and people say they talk about sound, they usually talk about sound like it's one thing like sound, making a good sound, finding a good sound, being relaxed, you know, produce, and in this kind of music, it's like there's a million different sounds and a million different ways to produce them. So when I show like a Monk video, I always end up showing like a Ben Webster video too, to talk about like oh, man. How, yeah. how many sounds this guy has. Like in when when we were kids, in not kid kids, but when we were in school, the composers who were studying in the 70s, well, there was a guy named Robert Kogan, and he taught there at New England, and he was very into timbre composition. Before timbre composition, and now again, that's a cliche now. You know, now everything is timbre composition. But in the seventies, it was a relatively new idea. There was only one book about timbre composition, which was Robert Erickson's book *Sound Structures in Music*, and um, and then Robert Kogan was one of the few people who was really talking a lot about timbre. And I always make the jokes like every composer in the late 70s had a chin manual because like if, like in the Chinese chin manual, there were like a hundred different ways of producing the same pitch. Mm-hmm. They, you know, you play with the flesh of your finger, play with the fingernail, snap it with the thumb. Do, but they had notations for these things. I mean, mm-hmm. people did that in all blues music for sure. And like, yeah. like Ben Webb's, but they didn't have notation for it. But in the chin, they had notation for it. So we were all obsessed with getting chin manual, you know, like looking at all these things. It was it was a really new idea at the time. Anyway, how the hell did I get there? I don't even know. But anyway, that that's just something about something. It, it's a, it's an it's like an impro. Always these talks, you know. It's like a jazz impro. Like okay, we go there. Like okay, I love this. Are you are you actually in the Satchmo Club? Because I see the photo behind you. No, I, I played there. It's a poster. Oh yeah, I played there too in Maribor. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. like two thousand. I had a really funny gig. I had a funny gig there. Like I guess it's it's really a long time ago. Uh, I had played in Graz, and then like last minute, the guy who runs the place in Graz, he got us a gig at the Satchmo, so we just like drove there the next day because we had a free day and played, and it was really great. Yeah. Except they great. didn't have a real piano; they only had a big I electric know. piano. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it was a nice club. It was such a beautiful club. Is it yeah. gone? Is it? Yeah, yeah, is it it's, oh, that's yeah. too bad. That's too bad. Yeah. I had a really crazy night there. I, I remember it really well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was one of those places where it just went on until 7 a.m. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah, so, but beautiful, yeah. Uh, uh, Anthony, I wanted to ask you, like, you, you know, when I check the records I have you on, I have you, like, on 40 CDs, I think, and... Uh, I listened to some of your work, you know, your solo work and stuff with Zorn, and you're, you, you were so involved in this downtown scene, which was going on, like, since the beginning of the 80s. And how, how did you get involved in this and your view of what was going on in in those times, like, in the beginning of the 80s and your connection with Zorn? 
Okay, and you may need to ask me a bunch of questions because it's like each one goes down a particular track. Yeah, you know? yeah, you choose the so, path. <laughs> so the first one, no, first one, just how did I get involved? Is uh, what happened is I graduated from uh, Yale School of Music with my master's degree, and I took a look at the trajectory. First of all, I didn't when I was in New England Conservatory, it felt very like a family, and in a way, that's why I wanted to go somewhere else because you do have to leave your family at a certain point, you know, and um. But at Yale, it was not enough like a family. I felt very isolated. And then when I got to the end of my master's, I looked around and most of the people were going to go for an MFA and then they were going to go for a DMA. And then I was, uh, what, an MMA, then a DMA. And then they were going to try to get a teaching job. So mm -hmm. it was like, you go to school for 20 years so that you can get a teaching job and go back to school. And I was just like, I don't know. I don't know. It was just an intuition. It was like that that cannot be my life that cannot i don't know what my life can be but that cannot be my life so i came back to new york with no idea of what my life should be because i grew up in new york you know but i i had loved living six years away from my family to mm. be perfectly honest i had loved it it wasn't that mm. far but boston new haven it was enough away but my mother had given up her house because of divorce and had moved into a loft in Soho. So mm. I moved back in with my mother, which was tragedy, like literal tragedy, except for one thing. Two blocks away was a record store called the Soho Music Gallery. And I just walked in there and said, could I get a job? And they gave me a job. And mm. it turned out that this was right in the center of where everything was happening. So like pretty much the first week I was there, there was a guy working there named Yale Evelev. And Yale Evelev later ran um, David Byrne's record company, Luwakabop. Mm -hmm. But um, at that time, he was just, you know, working in the Soho Music Gallery, just figuring out his life like we all were. And he called me one day and he says, John Zorn's pianist, which means Wayne Horvitz, um, was, went out hiking in the Pacific Northwest and nobody can get in touch with him. Of course, these are the days before cell phones. Would you like to do, he, John Zorn has this gig that Wayne is supposed to do. Would you like to do a gig with him? And I, the only thing I knew about John Zorn was that Coda Magazine in Lund, in, um, in Canada used to have articles, you know, besides their usual coverage of regular jazz, they were starting to cover John and Eugene Chatborn. Mm. And I read about them and they sounded really interesting to me, but I had never heard them. And I said, sure. And he said, what is it? And then John calls me out and I said, yeah. I'd win. And I don't think that, um, I don't think that Yale was able to explain to me too much what the music was going to be. But then John calls me up and he says, yeah, it's mostly improvising, you know, come down. It'll be great very chill like you know very excited and so i just went no no and all of this the story of this is in the parachute years box you know how i went down and i said okay it's improvising great so we were playing the piece hockey and i brought all my i had been fooling around with prepared piano so i brought all my preparations and put them in and then there's a part in hockey where it says solo so when it was solo i just went to like you know did my thing and john goes yeah well that's great but you know a solo can be a lot of things a solo can be one note a solo can be silent you know a mm. solo can be this a solo and i was just like okay because my idea of free improvisation came totally from the free jazz paradigm at that point where you know there's a lot of intensity mm. and he was talking about something really different that was really new to me but interesting because I had studied a lot of music like that. I'd studied a lot of Webern and I got really interested in Morton Feldman and John Cage. So the idea that you had a lot of musical events that were surrounded by silence, that was interesting to me, but I had never really done that that much in terms of improvisation. And he says this thing like a solo could be one note, a solo could be silent. I was like, so how do you know it's a solo? And he goes, you just know. And I was like, <laughs> uh -huh. okay okay and i didn't really get it but slowly i noticed there were a bunch of players who kind of thought like this it was polly bradfield there was mark miller 
you know, they all like I don't know if you ever listened to the Polly Ball Bradfield solo record, but no, it's an amazing have to check it's it out. an okay. amazingly important record, and the whole thing is on YouTube now. So you can find it really easily. It's solo violin, but oh, like most, but most of it is just like eh, I'll send you the link. It's much easier. I, I, I you know what? I love sending links. It's, um <laughs> One second. Um, but I, I can find it, Anthony. No worries. I know, but you can, I can find it in eight seconds, literally. It, uh, it really, it's really easy. Um, Fantastic. Uh, yeah, but here we see. I've already found it. Here we go. Wait, one second. I'm clicking on it, and I am sending you the link. Okay, we are done. See, that was not, that was not. <laughs> that was fast. <laughs> uh, okay, one second, and... Uh, Go back to the big screen. Yep. And go back to the chat, wherever it is. And there you go. All right. So anyway, like, so there was like Polly Bradfield. There was Chad Bourne. There was like Mark Miller. Yeah. They all were kind of like, they would do these gigs and there would be a lot of like, eh, and I'd be like, wow, you know, I mean, this is a thing. It connects a lot to other music that I was interested in. But I hadn't really listened to much improvisation. Even like, let's say, the Art Ensemble of Chicago, if they might use that kind of vibe for a minute, but then they would go back into something that was more clearly in the tradition or whatever, you know? So it would be a color, they, especially if you listen to Roscoe's solo music or if you listen... I hadn't really listened that much to Wadada at that time anyway, you know? Mm, okay. but, I mean, there were people who were doing that, but they were doing it more as part of a vocabulary where that was. And this was like, people were going, you'd go to a concert and people would play like this for like two hours. And I'd just be like, if you listen to the hockey on the parachute years with, with Mark Miller and, and Polly and John, you know, they really have this thing they're working on that's for, and that just interested me that a vocabulary had come out of a scene. And I just wanted mm -hmm. to know about it. I felt a little bit, like a tourist, because I had never really listened to Derek Bailey. I had, I had I had never really listened to Evan Parker, you know, so it wasn't like I really had a background in that music at all. <laughs> but I was really interested in what these people were doing. And I was like, okay, okay, I'm going to learn. I'm going to learn how they know when something is good, when something is not, when something is a solo, when something isn't. I'm just going to find out, you know. And I spent a few years really just in it and it's almost like I could say I was in it and observing it at the mm, same time. Interesting. But meanwhile, because of the record store, one day Glenn Bronca comes in. This guy comes in, he looks terrible. He's like, I'm sure he's gonna, I'm sure he's going to um shoplift. You know, he looks like he kind of looks like that. <laughs> we had like serious shoplifting problem, you know. <laughs> And also sometimes with very famous musicians, but that I will not say. No, no, sure. <laughs> and he comes in and I was, and, and meanwhile, I was reading a lot of Coda magazine, right? And, and especially when they were talking about people that were doing things that were drawn from other traditions besides jazz. And one thing I read about was Henry Cow. And they were talking about how Henry Cow was using stuff that came from you know, more like experimental concert music and this mm. kind of that. And so uh, whenever the, the the manager wasn't there, whatever record I would read about, I would just open it up and like put it on the turntable. Like when, when he was there, we had to listen to things that would make people want to shop. But when he wasn't there, you know, we just listen to whatever the hell. So I was listening to Henry Cowell record and he goes like, what are you listening to? And I goes like, oh, I goes, this is a group from England. It's called Henry Cowell, Fred Frith plays guitar, you know, blah, blah. And he goes, well, that's, why are you listening to that? And I said, well, you know, I just graduated from this master's program in composition. And I've been reading that there's all these people that are doing things that are influenced by like contemporary composition and more like rock oriented improvisation. And he goes, oh, there are, but there's a lot of hell, a lot better stuff than that. I was like, like what, for example, is like my band. And I was like, oh, okay. Uh, what's your band? You know, it's called static. And, uh, and, um, and then they were playing like a couple of nights later in tier three. And he said, like, come on down and check it out. I'll put you on the guest list. And it was amazing. They only made like a couple of 45s static, but they're really incredible. And they were doing like these kind of things. A lot of stuff with building up over long repetitions and like, 
And then I, so then, you know, we started to hang out and talk a little bit every time he'd come in the store. Then he asked me to join his band. So that's how I ended up, just because the record store is why I ended up playing with Glenn Bronga and with John Zorn at the same time. So that's the answer to that part. Wow. <laughs> that's, wow, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, I, I, but, yeah. but the scene was so much, so alive. I mean, I, I talked to Elliot Sharp about this beginning of the 80s and he said it was so much happening. Also this bridging of uh, communities like funk going into jazz and uh, everything well for me that that really doesn't happen until a little bit later, later honestly right? yeah a little bit later because for me the, when i first was playing elliot was one of the few people that really was crossing over already at mm, that time. okay i mean i think if we look at the dates when they really start to cross is a little bit later I mean, yes, you have the punk jazz, like the lounge lizards already yeah. then, but when you really have the communities crossing is a little bit later to me. Because I know like when I was playing with the Bronco guys, none of them knew what was happening in the free improvisation scene. Mm, okay. The people in the free improvisation scene could care less about what was going on in the, in the bands like Bronco and Reese Chatham. Uh, Elliot is a big ex exception, but when that started to become a lot more global, I would say when the Knitting Factory came along. Yeah. Okay, because we all ended up like in that same space, you know. And then the, we, it was kind of the genius fact that the people who ran the knitting factory had no idea about any of this stuff. So there was just they would there was like all this stuff being booked, and right, and all of a sudden you started seeing like bands that were made up of people that came from all different scenes, you know? and that was really amazing. But I, for me, at least from my experience, that didn't really happen until like more like eighty six, eighty seven. Interesting, yeah. Uh, since, since we don't have so much time, uh, uh, I, I, we mentioned Disco by Night before, and uh, how, how did that record happen for you? And the well, I told you it. it came out. It came out of the summer of nineteen eighty-seven. Yeah, I was it... in. I was in Dubrava, yeah. and my mother came because it was the first birthday of my son. And we were in, and in those days, Dubrava still didn't have electricity, you know? So it was really interesting. Like the whole vibe around the beach at Bar was really interesting. Like, wow. but meanwhile, we would every day, because me and my ex wife, we were starting to really not get along. And I was there with her family, and the whole thing was a really bad vibe in some ways, right? But then I was really happy to be with my kid. And every day I would take him to a different place in Montenegro. So every day, we not maybe every single day, but pretty often we'd go to different beaches. So we went to Budva, we went to Velika Plaza, we went, yeah. you know, went all over the place. And I started noticing, because I'd been going to Yugoslavia since 1981, and I started noticing that people were not as friendly to me as they had been in the past. Mm. And that the energy around the vibe of the way people were interacting felt really different. And I remember and my server creation was better in those days. And I remember sitting on the deck and in the house and listening to the radio and people were really negative. I mean, like really fucking negative. Just like, I remember one guy saying like, why should anybody actually come here on vacation when it's no cheaper to come here than it is to go to Turkey or to go to like, why would they even come? And I was like, wow, this has really changed. And just like, Five years, because I remember when I first came in 81, everybody was, it just felt like this weird kind of Balkan paradise to me. Mm -hmm. And I, I just felt so in love with it. It was the, so different from anything that I had ever experienced in my life. And now it felt like it was starting to get very cold and negative. And, but that was also connected to the fact that my marriage was falling apart. Yeah. But I remember we went out to dinner one night and there was this big group and Normally, if you went out in a big group, people were super nice and they were really cold and very unfriendly. I don't even remember which town this was in, but it was like it was just, it could have been it could have been any of the towns I just mentioned, or it could have been could have been in Kotor. I don't really remember where it was, but I just remember that feeling of like people being really short and not friendly. And and then I said to my mother, "This country is going down the drain." And my mother said, "You're just saying that because you're not getting along with your wife." And I said. Okay, you just wait and see. I'm going to tell you, like, I've been, you you haven't been coming here every year like I have, you know? I'm going to tell you, like, this place, something really bad is happening. There's, like, seriously bad energy going on, you know? And, like, but, of course, it's also true that it had so much to do with what was going on mm. for me, personally, that it was hard to separate. 
And then, of course, a year or two later, everything kind of totally fell apart. And I was just like, whoa, what the hell, you know? And then I was kind of like almost homeless for a year because I wasn't like, I was sleeping on friends' couches. And I decided I really needed to put all this together in mm, music okay. that was not. And then what was really, see, this is a problem because I could talk about this record for like an hour, you know? Because sure. it was, all the, no, because the thing about it was I didn't want to write Balkan music, okay? I wanted to write what it would feel like from a person, me, but let's say I'd be a character, okay, who would sit in a club, let's say, in any place, Sarajevo or anywhere, or, or you know, or Belgrade or or Novi Sad, because I had gone on a little mm. trip to Novi Sad and the music was different there, you know, mm -hmm. and, or, or, or on the Adriatic, or I had never been, I had never been to Kirk, but I'd heard the music from Kirk, for example, you yeah. know, and that music is really special. It was like somebody more like me, like a very, I don't know what's a word to say, like a kind of overly intellectual cosmopolitan New Yorker sort of taking that kind of stuff in and filtering it through his own experience of what he's feeling and what's happening in his life there. Because there was this band, and this was very important, that used to play in the Hotel Moskva in Belgrade. And we used to go there and they had these really great, like a Kirsten Pira, uh, uh, um, this dessert. Mm -hmm. And then we'd go there and eat Kirsten Pira and, and drink coffee. And the band was like, everybody was like on the verge of death. Like there, everybody was so old. It was like, <laughs> and they, and it was like a Viennese band because they would, they would play this kind of like, if you would go to like a little Viennese cafe, except because it was in Belgrade, it was somehow something a little bit off from it. Yeah, like, yeah. yes, kind of like Viennese, but not, but yes, but no. And I remember that the funny thing was a violinist, he used to always play like this. So when he got off the stage, because he was like 80 years old, he had been doing this for so long that when he got off the stage, he walked like that too, you know, <laughs> and like, and I remember the time when the trombonist had gotten a new blood pump from Germany and he had brought his blood pump to the gig and he passed it around so everybody could see the... <laughs> everybody oh, on the wow. stand, it was just like a real vibe. And it was so, I was just so mesmerized by all the similarities and differences in life. I started collecting Yugoslav pop music. Uh, I was the... I once got out of a really bad jam because I was looking at, I went to the neighborhood in Belgrade where the zoo is and the, the Lebanese, there were a lot of embassies not far from there. And um, there was, a, I was looking at this beautiful embassy trying to figure out what it was. It was just a beautiful building. Like Belgrade had a lot of old buildings, but didn't yeah. necessarily have a lot of beautiful old buildings, you know? And this one was very beautiful. It turned out it was the Lebanese embassy. But I was looking at it too long, and this policeman comes up to me. He says, what are you looking at? And I said, I'm just looking at this building. And he goes, why are you looking at it? I said, well, you know, he goes, show me your ID. I was like, I don't carry my ID everywhere I go. Said, well, why don't you? You're supposed to. And I said, well, because, you know, I'm like here for three months. You're here for three months. What are you doing for three months? So, well, I'm with my future wife. You have a future wife in Belgrade? I said, yeah, I, you know. And he said, like, yeah, I do. And he goes, you know. <laughs> and then he says, like, ah, oh, yeah, Yugoslav women are the best. Naibolia, Naibolia, Nesveta, Zarnea. I say, oh, yeah, totally. Oh, absolutely. You know, and then it's like, and so he goes, like, oh, yeah. I, um, he says, like, Daliti Vole should not, um, um, Nova Kumbanavana music. And I said, yeah, sure, why not? You know, I, I'm a musician, so I listen to all kinds of stuff. And he's like, what's your favorite? And I said, I don't know what my favorite, my, uh, my, my, my millennia, my millennia. I think uh, I, the language is gone, you know, as I told you. Uh, and I said, well, I, I don't know, but I memorized a song by Miroslav Ilyich. And he goes, which single song did you memorize? And I said, I memorized this one. And he was like, you're amazing. Wow, great to meet you. You and actually then, are amazing, man. It's, this is perfect. <laughs> I love it, man.
And so, like, I got out of the jam with the police, you know. And this was the kind of shit that was going on every day. Every day. I mean, sometimes it had funny endings. Sometimes it wasn't funny. But yeah, yeah. there was this kind of thing. And then all of a sudden, it got cold. And I was like, man, what happened? But also my life got cold. So I couldn't separate. So I wanted to write music about that. Mm, okay. So later, a couple of years later, when everybody in the New York scene became interested in Balkan music and they were all doing it and people were like, oh, you were doing that before. And I was like, no, I really wasn't because I was never interested in really playing like Bulgarian music Seven well or whatever. Yeah, like yeah. that. That yeah. was never my interest, you know? It was really this filtering of my experience and coming up with a sound to reflect that experience. Yeah. And as much as I liked what like Pachora was doing and stuff like that, or or the Paradox Trio, I never thought what we were doing was the same, you know? They were much more like, this is going to sound insulting, and I don't mean it to be insulting, but they sounded like very good students of Baltic, of both of Balkan music, you know, like they had really I decided no. they, had, they like wanted to learn the grooves and the tempos and like, and how to play in seven and the inflections. And I was interested in that, but that was not my purpose. Mm. I guess that's the best way to explain it. No, no, makes sense. Yes. So I put this into a thing and I organized this band and it was all people that I thought could do it. And the first clarinetist was David Krakauer. But the thing was, David was just so virtuosic in his approach and was already becoming such a star of like yeah. klezmer music that he made it always a little too much like klezmer or like David Krakauer klezmer. And we got, and it's funny because he was my oldest friend. I mean, we had been really close in high school and stuff. Mm. But, but like, it was really upsetting because we really almost came to blows because it's like, I said, like, Balkan music is not, like, that kind of klezmer music. Like, when people take solos in Balkan music, they usually only get, like, a drop louder than what they were doing before. They don't really, like, step up and go, like, what? They just don't do it like that. It's like, I mean, I, you know, I was listening to a lot of stuff, and the important thing is the landscape. Like, you've got mm -hmm. the middle ground, and then you step up a little, and then you go back and forth like that. You, got, you can't go, like, Ooh, way out in front. Like a solo solo, like a jazz solo. You can't do it like that. So we got we got to do it. And then one day he couldn't do it. And I tried to get Marty Ehrlich, who had replaced him one time before. But Marty wasn't free. And he said, why don't you call Doug Weaselman? Mm. And and I said, I only thing I knew of Doug Weaselman was playing tenor saxophone in Wayne Harvitz's band, The President. And I was like, you think he'd be good for it? And Marty said, I think he'll be great for it. And the very first rehearsal, Doug started playing one of the pieces. And I said, yeah, but it's not quite, it's a little more. And Doug goes like, oh, you mean, and he's sitting in a chair like this, right? And he goes, oh, you mean like, and he just goes like that. And I go like, that's my guy, you know? Yeah. That is my guy who like, instead of being like this, you go a little more like that. I was like, oh shit, you know, this is a guy who really gets it. And so then it became a whole thing, but they were the perfect people. Once yeah. it was Jim and, 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 um, and, guy yeah, it's beautiful. and, and, and Doug, and they really understood that same thing. None of them tried to be like great Balkan music players. You know, there was more like this kind of, I mean, we again, it's like very tricky to find the language. Like you could say simulacrum or refraction or reflection. And we tried it out. There's a ton of music that didn't make it onto the record, you know, because I just kept trying to write pieces that would do what I was talking about. Sometimes I went too far over in one direction. Like I used to tape a lot of radio. And I used to like use the rhythms of the people that I heard on the radio. And there was one really great one where I taped Albanian radio. Mm, and, wow. the, and the woman said, and the woman said, post telegraph telecom tiran. And it's just the way that the rhythm of that was so fantastic. Post telegraph, te post telephone telegraph tiran. But I got to do it one more time. Post telephone telegraph tiran. Yeah. And it, and it's just like, uh, and I tried to make that, like try to use it like a sample. And it was a great idea, but the piece never went anywhere. We just kind of did that over and over again. And it's like, all right, all right, now what, you know? 
So a lot of those kind of pieces <laughs> were made. I made lots, at least twice as much music or three really? times as oh, much wow. music as what ended up. You know, because there were all these attempts. It was I tried to keep it like a living thing, not like here's my here's my sonata based on my time in Yugoslavia. Fuck, that's that's so not what I wanted. I wanted it to be collaborative in that sense. Like there was written out things, but we fooled around with them. We made them into a thing, and they either worked or they didn't. So now I've told you about the very first record that I made. And now I don't know what to say. I mean, that's what that's what I unfortunately there's not a short answer to these things, you know. No, it's beautiful. I mean, I, I could listen to you for hours. <laughs> I, I think you should come to Slovenia to Maribor and we should open like, I mean, two bottles of wine and I, we just sit on the <laughs> terrace and you talk. So. But before we go, you should ask me about something that happened more recently than 30 years ago. That's yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I just that, but uh, I wanted to ask you, like, what's on the schedule for you for... Uh, oh, what's on the schedule? Let's see. Okay, for the, do you have any plans to come into Europe also? Or... I always have plans. It's whether people have plans to bring me to Europe or not, you know? <laughs> I, I, I always have plans. The last time I was in Europe was two, two summers ago. I came with um, John Arabagon and Joe Hertenstein as Ooh. a trio. Really? And Joe Hertenstein's trio. And we made a record for... Um, for Jazz Werkstatt, and I think it should be coming out anytime. You oh, know, well, super. I have to get it. And yeah. we, we played at the Pikes Festival, and we did a bunch of stuff. And it was great. It was great. It was my first time in Europe in four years. And I was hoping that it would lead to many more trips, which so far it hasn't. But, um, you know, I, what the reality is, I always have plans. I mean, I used to feel like, I think I used to tour like four months out of the year. And, wow, um, man. Okay. And it was great, you know, and I miss it. Of course, I have a full-time job now, so there is that. But, um, yeah, but as far as plans, I mean, you know, like what I started doing again, like I said, in these last four weeks, is just kind of these getting together with musicians that I've really enjoyed playing with. Like, like I said, with Matt Maneri, with, um, you know, with Satoshi, with, with, yeah. Satoshi with, with Brian Chase and, and so on, and just re-exploring and hopefully, you know, without having too many preconceived notions of where it's going to go of course i'd love it to go somewhere <laughs> i mean i was very happy last year i played two big festivals just not in europe i played big ears with mm -hmm. Cuba. Oh, yeah. so then i also played solo and uh and i also played at the victoriaville festival with a really great band that i thought was going to become like a real thing but I think it's not going to, although if it does, I will be very happy. It was the band of my former student, Simon Haynes. I don't know if you've met Simon, no, but no, no. But uh, he has a band called Tredi Chibachi, and he's okay. also done a lot of the Zorn Bagatelles. Okay. Uh, and with a band called Trigger. And with Trigger, he's been to Ljubljana. I know that. He's oh. played in, um, he played in Matalkova with, uh, with really? Trigger. Really? Yeah. Oh, okay. I have to check him out. And, um, and, um um yeah and so simon started this band this like the it's the most what's what should i say what's the, what's the right word for this i gotta think I, there's a really good word but it's you know it's a band that crosses the it's it's the least ageist band in new york city it's like it's like a mix of like so it's got me and Simon, Simon, who's like just turned thirty, and me, and it's got Calvin Weston, well, and it's got, and it's got Aaliyah Oltan, who's also a cellist, who's like Simon's age, you know. And it's fucking crazy. I always say it's like it's the friendly side of No Exit. Of no, sorry. Of, see, my language is all fucked up. It's the friendly side of Last Exit. Okay. It's, it's like if Last Exit were friendly, it would sound like this, you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a cool description. That's for the you promoters. Know, like, well, I'm just saying because you know, last exit it always sounded like everything was like that. Ah! Yeah, yeah. And we're the same, except it's a friendly version of it. it's like. <laughs> <you know? laughs> we don't. I don't know. It's, we're not those. We're not like you think about it, Diamanda, Peter Bratzman. Yeah, yeah. Bill Laswell. You're not. They're not like they're great, you know, but they're not like they're well, always not, there. Everything's very like end of the world, like apocalyptical, you know. So we make the same kind of sounds, only 
Peter Brotsman, I'm very proud to say Peter Brotsman once really dissed me in an interview. Really dissed me. Oh, shit. Oh, my God. Like, so hardcore for being mm. too funny. For being too funny. Oh, man. <laughs> and said, like, humor has no place in music, you know? And, and you know what? I'll be honest with you. I don't really care about humor in music. If I'm humorous, it's just because I am. I don't try to be humorous. I'm, I'm like... I, I really don't believe in trying to be humorous, particularly. I mean, there are some people who do it really mm. great comedians. They're amazing, but I never tried to be humorous, but you know, it's, but I understood he, re, we shared a bill in Pittsburgh once me and when I was playing with Roy Nathanson P and Peter Brussman was playing trio and just so happened that somebody interviewed him right after goes, I saw Roy Nathanson and Anthony Coleman and humor has no place in the improvised music. And, and, um, and um, you know, what sucks I used to think the internet is forever and I can't find that interview anymore. Oh, it, was on, it was on somebody's blog spot and it's, 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 I don't know. I'm not good enough at digging through the, um, whatever that thing is called the Wayback machine. To, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm so proud of that. You know, that's a one cool one. Proudest, I it's one of my proudest moments I, <laughs> that I was so, that it was, my humor was so much a thing that it was threatening to be to Brodsman, you know, <laughs> I love it, man. So, which is why I say our band is like the why I say our band is like the uh, the, the 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 friendly side of of Last Exit, you know. And it is. And we had a really great gig, a couple of really great gigs, and I was hoping it would be more. But you know, it's nowadays. I don't know if you experience this too, but I mean, it's like like keeping a project together. It's oh, like man. what yeah. is the, what is the impetus for keeping a project together? I mean, if anybody keeps a project together. Who's not married? I mean, the people who are married, okay, I understand how they keep a project together, you know. <laughs> a lot of, but, but the people who are not, I mean, I mean, it's hard. I, you yeah, know, I it is. Uh yeah, I don't know. So right now uh, it's these things, these things that sometimes threaten to turn into projects, and then they almost turn into projects. Yeah. And that's what happens, you know. I don't know. That's that's that's. That. But then the other side of that, which I have to say before I go, is teaching is very important. I've been doing teaching at New England Conservatory, my alma mater, for almost twenty years. Yeah. And a lot of the people who studied with me, not necessarily because of me, or because of Joe Morris, because Joe Morris is the other really important teacher of that kind of music. And, yeah. But of course, there's the more jazz-oriented teachers as well. You know, Billy Hart still teaches there, and um, Cecil McBee still teaches there, and you know, et cetera, et cetera. A lot of them have gone out in the world and are doing like uh, a lot of stuff. You know, yeah. and that's important. Yeah, that that's fun. Yeah, to see I them. Know. Yeah, I don't know. There you go. What else? <laughs> the problem about talking about old things is you talk a lot about old things. Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's beautiful to hear you. I, I mean to listen to you. Like, like I said, if we had more time, we, we haven't touched like many, many things yet. But n next time, I guess. Well let, me see. well, let me see. Give it, give it, give it four more minutes. Ask me one more thing, and I'll before I go. Okay. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I wanted to ask you your experience with Rebo, like because you mentioned it in the beginning. How did you connect with Mark? Well, yeah, that's again similar in a way because you know it's like the scene. Like I said, all these kind of strange experiences where they don't even know that you never. In those, okay, the difference between now and then is like then you would have one of these things like having that gig out of nowhere with John, but it would really turn into a thing and it would build, 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 build. Nowadays, you have great experiences like that, but because there's not the same relation to touring and record yeah. companies. Yeah. Sometimes you have these beautiful things, but sometimes they're very evanescent. They happen once or twice. And then there's just not the impetus to keep them going. Like I say, I just mm. admire anybody who keeps anything going at this point. So with Mark, what happened is we did a gig with Arno Lindsay mm. at uh, the Knitting Factory that was, and this again, this needs a half hour of a description what happened. Because oh, it's please. like, it's like, I'm not, I'm not going to give it because I don't no, have time. Sure. But, but it was insane. It was like, was like this gig. And Kazu, who later became the founder of uh, the band uh, Blonde Redhead, she in those days was singing 
Billie Holiday songs. She had just come over from Japan and I borrowed a keyboard sampler because I didn't have, they didn't have a piano in the knitting factory yet in those days. And I borrowed Jim Pugliese's new keyboard sampler. And um, he didn't tell me, you don't plug a keyboard sampler directly into the wall. So I plugged it directly into the wall and I fried it out. It was dead. And then I had to get my organ. So I was using my little rock organ to accompany Billy Holiday songs that were supposed to sound like I was like Teddy Wilson or something, you know. And instead it was like, <laughs> and then John Lurie was like involved with Kazoo at that time. And John Lurie wasn't playing, but he was walking around making comments and he was like, that organ is a fucking disaster. Oh my God, that organ is a fucking disaster. And Reba was on this gig and it was the first time I had ever met him. And I was just like so humiliated that if I would see Mark in the street, I would just walk the other way, you know? So like, so, <laughs> so, so then it should, how it should happen. Like two years later, we're on a Cobra together, a Zorn Cobra. And I didn't even go up to him. I just tried to pretend he wasn't there. And then he comes up to me and he goes, hey, I haven't seen you since the worst gig I ever played in my life. And I said, that was the worst gig you ever played in your life. That was the worst gig I ever played in my life. It was like, let's be friends, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, then, so then there was a club on the corner of 7th Street and Avenue B called King Tut's Wawa Hut. And one night Rebo says, uh, calls me up, he goes like, um, uh, you know, I'm doing this band and it's like, you know, it's just basically, again, the same thing. It's basically improvisation, you know, blah, blah, blah. And um, yeah, you want to play? Don Byron's playing clarinet. I was like, Don Byron, okay, you know, sounds. This, uh, uh, funny thing is, Don Byron and I had gone to high school, but I was two years really? older. Than, oh well. I no, but I was a senior when he was a freshman, so he knew me, but I didn't know him. You know, he was like a baby. He was fourteen. I was seventeen. You know, it's a big difference when you're that age. Sure. So, um, so I show up. And we have like a three hour sound check. This is something I came to know with Mark very well over the years. Like, the, hey, we're just going to play. And then you show up and there's like hundreds of pages of music. And they're all scrawled because he has this very particular way of it with lots of crossing out. And like, and so like, we're looking at this thing and I'm trying to understand it. And I do the best I can. And I'm just with my organ and like, there's Dawn and, I don't I don't remember if Brad Jones was playing bass, but maybe he was. And and um this guy named Richie Schwartz who was playing with Don was playing drums. And I just tried to get this music the best I could. And I was kind of like, oh, this is so much music and it's so hard to read, and I just don't know what I'm doing. We did the gig, and people seemed to like it. And after the gig, Mark comes up to me and he says, Great, you know, so we'll be making the record in the spring for Antilles. And um I was like, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> so it was, you know, close to a major label. It was a yeah, subsidiary, sure. subsidiary of Island. Island, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and um, it was that record, the first record of the Rootless Cosmopolitans. Yeah. But he, he pulled this amazing bait and switch on me because I just showed up like not having, you know, and then I felt like there's so much junk here. What am I going to make out of this, you know? And we did it. And then he says, okay, so we'll be making the record in the spring. And, you know, that. And I was like, cool. Great. And that was in, like, I don't know, 1989. And well, yeah. now 35 years later, I'm still playing with him. So what can I say? I'm a... <laughs> that's amazing. But then, of course, there's all the experiences with the Cubanos. And that's a yeah, yeah, whole that's... life in itself. That's a whole life in itself. Yeah, that's another. So there you have. I guess yeah. I better pull the pull, better pull the plug at that point. I've, I've got to go watch it. I'm going to meet my son, and we're going to watch a movie uh, uh, of uh, Imamura. Do you know the director Imamura? No, no. He's a great, great Japanese director from like most made most of his great films like in the '60s and '70s. Mm, okay. And, yeah. um, Super. That we bond a lot over cinema, so that's uh, that's important. That's what yeah. we're doing, you know. Yeah. Oh yeah, Definitely. absolutely. Definitely. So I, yeah, I mean, sure. I, I, it's a pleasure to talk. I, you know, once I get started, I'm like a like a fucking jack in the box or whatever. Oh you come know, on, you have so much history. Just... You've done so much stuff. So it's like, it's amazing. <laughs> you know, it's like like I said. Next time you come here, we're we're we'll open a bottle of wine and 
<laughs> that's good. I mean, that, that, that's that, I'm looking forward to that. You know. Yeah. So cool, man, Anthony. Uh, thanks so much again, and enjoy the movie. And uh, I hope Thank to you. see you soon in Europe, in Slovenia. Mm -hmm. Thank you.